everybody and welcome back to The Search. I hope everybody has had a great week since the last time we've seen each other and I hope you guys are doing well. If this is your first time, welcome, welcome and if you're returning back, thank you, thank you. My name is Lisa and I focus mainly on unsolved missing, unsolved murders and some trafficking cases. So unsolved being our key word here. So I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. And by doing that, you please subscribe and uh, turn your notifications on. That way you know you don't miss anything. We upload every Thursday at 8 p.m. Let's get into today's case. This case is about 13, 14 years old, but it is such a an important case as all are this one i took on was a doozy i actually was looking at another case in this area of the country and i came across this one and man the the details the details the details so what i tried to do is kind of go through and instead of making this a five hour video or five parts i tried to just pull from it what I felt would be great to hear and helpful and just kind of not so overwhelming that you kind of lose track of the importance of the case and the facts of the case. I will let you guys know that I get all my information from the public. I do not have any private investigators or connections with the detectives. So I always say, do your own research form your own opinions. We will discuss a little bit about what I think towards the end. So guys, let's just jump into it. There's a lot to unravel. We are going to be talking about Kyron Horman. He was born September 9th, 2002 in Portland, Oregon. He was born to Desiree Young and Kane Horman. They married, so they both, have, of course, have the same last name at the time. Kane was an engineer, and Desiree was an accountant. They had good jobs, good homes, doing, you know, pretty well. But that takes a little bit of a turn. The couple divorced when she was eight months pregnant with Kyron. And they just said it was unreconcilable differences. Things were not going right. And allegedly there was some cheating going on on Kane's side. They were granted shared custody and they did it very well. They were able to meet in the middle and make it work. But unfortunately, in 2004, when Desiree was diagnosed with kidney failure, that required her to have like a lot of extra medical things. If you know anything about kidney disease, it, it takes a lot. She had a lot of responsibility just to help keep her better, get better, so that she could be the best that she could be. So at that time, Kane took over full custody. They still were able, made sure that Kane got to see her. Kane was very close with his mom. So there was never those issues of can't see the kids or the fighting between the biological parents. Nothing like that. Even though things happen, I like the fact that they were great at co-parenting. And even when Desiree got really sick, and, you know, he stepped in and was like, I will do this and we'll make sure that you don't lose time with your son. Moving on from that, in 2007, Kane married a woman by the name of Terry Moulton. She was a substitute teacher. So, I mean, she really enjoyed kids. I would feel if you're a substitute teacher, right? So that is what she did. Uh, she originally came from Roseburg. Kane became romantically involved with her around 2001. So let's step back a little bit. They married in 2007 while visiting in Hawaii. Now, in December of 2008, Terry gave birth to a daughter, Kiara, and... 
Kyron, at that time, was already a student at Skyline Elementary School near Forest Park. So, just to kind of recap everything so that we can follow it. So, Kane and, and Desiree are together. They're married. She gets pregnant. And around the eighth month, it's like, this isn't working. And they end up getting a divorce. Okay, everything goes good, though, between them far as sharing custody. And then, unfortunately, Desiree gets sick, right, with the kidney disease. And then Kyron goes full-time to Kane. Now, as I just disclosed, of course, he moves on and is with, meets Terry Moulton. And they end up getting married, but comes out that they actually started having kind of a fling in 2001. That's where we're at now. And they've now had their own child together. Terry had a child prior to this. So she had an older son. But together now, they have a daughter. And sweet little Kyron is now in elementary school. He is seven years old. And he is just so precious. June 4th, 2010, Kyron was taken to Skyline Elementary by his stepmom, Terry, that morning, who stayed with him while they attended a science fair. So let me back up. That morning, usually... She uses a different car. Uh, I believe she ended up using Kane's vehicle that day. But anyway, that is one of the reasons she took him to school was because he had his science project. That day of school was actually a little different because of the science fair. We all know how it goes. They go in, they set up, there's different times. So actually, school was not fully beginning until 10 30 so times were a little off that day because kids were like in the cafeteria libraries you know all over it's always such a big deal all right so i just want to kind of set the vision of what this day looks like with that i want to tell you that terry claims that she stated that she left the school around 8 45 and that she last remembered seeing Kyron walking down the hall to his class. However, though, Kyron was never seen in his first class and was instead marked absent that day. Now, I mean, I don't want to jump too far. What I want to say is, Terry that day, like she said earlier, took him there. Took him to the science fair. After she went in there, she took pictures with him. And she said that she went on and walked him, like, basically to his class, but not all the way. And that way she could go out the door to her car. Now, his class was on the second level. So he went up, like, one, like one set of stairs. And she kind of walked up the other set of stairs. She's seen him kind of walk down the hallway uh, and go to his class. And as she walked out to her car, the day goes on. 3.30 comes. At 3.30, Terry and her husband, Kane, walk their, with their daughter, Kara, because remember, Kara's little, to the bus stop to meet Kyron. When the bus told them that the boy had not even boarded the bus, and to call the school to ask the whereabouts, Terry did so, only to be told by the schools he was marked, you know, as absent. He was seen, you know, with his science project, but after that, there's not anything uh, stating that he was here. Secretary started realizing all this. She called 911, all right? She was like, oh no, something is not right. At that time, the search efforts begin. Where is Kyron? What's going on? Let's talk to the teachers. Let's find out what's going on. When the police get there and they start asking questions, they go, of course, to the teacher. The teacher claims that the Terry, the stepmom, had let her know that he had an appointment that day. 
Well, Terry's like, no, I did not tell you that. There was no appointment. He had his appointment next week. That already is like, what? Terry's statement to the police indicates that after leaving the school at 845, she ran errands at two different Fred Meyer grocery stores until about 1010. All right. Between then and 11.39, these are very exact times, she stated that she was driving her daughter around town in attempt to use the motion of the vehicle to soothe the toddler's earache. All right, so I wanted to make sure that I quoted her times right, but she's basically saying that she's doing this driving around because the daughter's ears hurting. Now, I actually did that when my son was a child. I can remember that the only thing that would get him to quit crying would be that driving, you know, and it was like as soon as we hit a stop sign or a red light or something, it was like, ugh, they knew it. So, I understand that that is something that can be done, but let's keep going. Terry said that then she went to a local gym and exercised until about 1240, meaning, by the way, the daughter goes into daycare. So she goes from having this earache, okay, having this earache, having to be drove around, to now she's good enough to go into the gym, though, and be in the, be in the daycare, okay. So then... She said that she stayed there, like I said, till 12.40. By 1.21 p.m., she had arrived home and posted a photo of Kyron at the science fair on her Facebook. Once police investigators also went around and were talking to people, because we're going to get into about the search and all that stuff. But right now, we're just trying to figure out, all right, you dropped him off. What did you do today? Everybody you know, was being asked not to mention that the secretary, actually, I believe was the one that called the mom, Desiree, and she lives like five hours away. Can you imagine what it was like her having to get together all her stuff not and sick to get down there to help search for her son? You know, so she's on her way down as all this is kind of going on and things are starting. Now we get into the search efforts of what they all were doing because a little boy just doesn't just disappear. So the search efforts for Chiron were so extensive and primarily focused on about a I would say two mile radius is what they were saying around the Skyline Elementary. And Savi Island, which is approximately six miles away, law enforcement did not disclose at that time their reasons for searching the area where they did, which included the search of the Savi Island Bridge. When I tell you that this was an extensive search, when I mean extensive, there were so many people. I want to say over a 10-day search, they quoted that there was over 1,300 searchers that they came from California, Washington, and of course, in Oregon. I mean, they were looking high, low, everywhere, you know, talking to everyone. Now, Desiree also remarried to a man named Tony who actually was former law enforcement. When they got down there, you know, he also kind of said a lot of things as far as how this kind of is going to work, trying to prep, you know, the family that now people are focused on us, you know, which is a good thing because we want as much attention as we can get. There was just little like 
advices he gave, which I thought was a good thing. It's always good to kind of have someone on both sides, whether it's attorneys, police officers, whatever. Sometimes you may feel like they're not doing enough and maybe the other side can tell you we are or, you know, we can't disclose everything and that's a big thing. I want to tell you this. On June 9th, the Horman family, who initially refused to speak to the media, released a statement. Now, the reason that they had refused is they were pretty much instructed not to say things, okay? So it wasn't that they did not want to cooperate. So this was on the 9th. So we're talking like five days. They got together, all of them. So you had Tony, Desiree, Kane, and Terry there pulling together as a unit to talk about what was going on. And Kyron's family would like to thank people for support and interest in finding their son. The outpouring of support and continued effort strengthens their hope. We need for our folks to continue to assist us in our goal. Please search your properties, cars, outbuildings, sheds, etc. Also, check with neighbors, friends who may be on vacation or may need assistance in searching. There is a lot of resources here to help you search, so please don't stop. It is a, obviously a difficult time and they want to speak to the public so you can hear it from Kyron's family as they came together to share their message. There is an objective to keep the focus on Kyron. This was basically a statement that was released to the media. On June 12th, around 300 trained rescuers were on the ground. They were like searching the wood. Like I told you, the wooded areas near the school. So behind there, there was like very dense, you know, thick woods. But, it, you know, it was around there. Also, there was other things they were looking into. It was said that they also need to see how many SA offenders and predators lived around there. The search for kind expanded, like I said, about 10 full days. And I told you it was the largest in history at that time, over 1,300. At that time, also, Chiron had initially 25,000 that expanded to a 50,000 in late July of 2010 reward. So, in June 2010, the midst of the search, Kane was reportedly told by investigators that Terry had offered a landscaper, Rodolfo Sanchez, a money to kill her husband. This was five months. So this means that Rodolfo came to and told. Now, I don't see any reason why he would just make this up. And you want to know the other weird thing? Kane didn't even know they had a gardener. He did, he did not even know that there was a gardener. So this is already telling you, sneaky, sneaky, Mr. Sanchez, he testified in the deposition that Terry approached him to help kill her husband in January of 2010. So like I said, it's five months before the disappearance. Terry denied the charge. First of all, why would he like insert himself inside of the investigation and just create these just to be a part of something? Are you kidding me? You know, especially that he didn't report a murder for hire attempt. No. So I'm feeling like Sanchez is probably uh, telling the truth here and probably like, oh God, what is going on? You know, and maybe even having like guilt. Like if I had said something could I have prevented whatever's going on now? So I'm glad that he came forward. By doing that, the investigators are like, look, let's get you what, hooked up basically to see if they can get like information out of Terry to where she's admitting. Because right now, things are looking a lot towards her. 
So he did wear a wire. He did go and try to get it, but he was unable to obtain like any like good evidence. They could not make an arrest on that. But on June 28th, look, there's so much going on. It boggles my mind how much has happened seriously happened and it's like how was everything so kosher up until then and now like all this stuff is happening why people didn't know some of these things like i don't i don't get it on june 28th though kane filed for divorce and obtaining a restraining order against terry the divorce was granted and terry was eventually granted supervised visitations with her daughter so she could see her daughter, but they were supervised. As they start digging more into looking at Terry, Terry took two polygraph, all right, examinations. Would you like to know how she did? Absolutely terrible. She failed both of them. Both, not once, but twice. As we know, though, they cannot be used in court, but they sure can help detectives. Like, all right, are we on the right trail? Do you want to know what? I'm just kind of jumping ahead, but she actually was on Dr. Phil's show. And Dr. Phil questioned her about that, about the polygraphs. And her response was that she had, she was hard of hearing and pretty much deaf in one ear. You know, Dr. Phil's going to debunk that real quick like he does. And before you take a polygraph, everything is confirmed. Can you hear? You know, are you physically comfortable? You know, they go over all the things, you know, trust she's not the first person hard of hearing that has taken a test. That was her reason. You know, she had reasons of why. Dr. Phil says, you know, as you know, he says on there, you know, I've got some of the best in the country that would be willing to, you know, do this polygraph. She refused. She refused and kind of did like a little dramatic walk out. She wouldn't do it. So, that's just kind of a little moving forward on things. Like I said, guys, it's a lot to unwrap. And I'm trying to just give you some details of why they keep going back to Terry. Because they're not getting any evidence anywhere else from this. On August of 2010, law enforcement were searching for individuals. Allegedly, there was two people that were seen by witnesses that were sitting inside Terry's truck outside Skyline Elementary the day of the disappearance. Bruce McCain, who was a former sheriff of Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, told CBS News the identity of the second person, if he or she exists, could be critical in determining what happened to Kyron after 9 a.m. on June 4th. So, let me go back. I think I said two people. What it was, two witnesses claimed that they seen someone in the car in Terry's truck that day. So, at school. All right. Also, witnesses have stated that they seen her walking back to the truck with Chiron. So there has been that said also. In July of 2010, the grand juries started subpoenaing people, several friends of Terry, including a lady by the name of Dee Dee Spicer, whom Young and Kane described as having been in close communication with Terry and providing Terry with support advice and is not in the best interest of the son so the family you know they know about Dee, Dee but they are not feeling that Dee, Dee is pro terry and not hearing anything that the other family's saying and going to kind of do whatever terry needs 
basically her sidekick. So, not quite sure if they can get the truth out of her or not. According to law enforcement, Spicer was extremely cooperative and allowed a search of her property and car, as well as enduring three hours of questioning. On the day of Kyron's disappearance, Dee Dee abruptly left her job. She was working gardening as a homeowner over there in Germantown Road. Around 11.30 a.m., she left, and then they said she returned probably about an hour and a half or so. She also says that allegedly helped Terry purchase an untraceable phone. During this time, Spicer told journalists, there's this horror story that my friend is just going through. If I thought for a second that she was capable of foul play, I would not have been there she would not have been my friend in the first place. So Dee Dee's basically saying that she would never, ever help her with that. And if she knew, she wouldn't even be her friend. She also claims that she did not hear anybody looking for her, that she was far back in the field. So she's saying that she did not even leave, like she wasn't even gone. She was gone. They also talked about her buying an untraceable phone for Terry. Why would she need to do that? In August, both Desiree and Kane and the Skyline Elementary School principal were subpoenaed and testified during grand jury. In December 2010, it was reported to the Oregon that the grand jury had yet to provide compelling evidence, yielding a potential indictment. Then we get into November 29th. Search efforts in Kyron's case had cost an estimate of $1.4 million, guys. That's a lot. That tells you that doing awareness and research and volunteer work is so needed, so needed, 1.4 million. So guys, we move forward to May of 2017. It was reported by Portland, Oregon, that a secret grand jury panel continued to hear evidence of Kyron's disappearance and conveyed on multiple occasions. During that report, Kyron's case was described as still active, and ongoing. Then in July of 2017, law enforcement conducted further searches along Skyline Boulevard, but the searches yielded no results. In 2018, Young posted on the official Find Kyron Horman Facebook page, and she put on there, Stay tuned, something big is coming, I promise you. I want to talk about, as times are going on, they are trying to get enough evidence against Terry. Like I tell you, it's going to grand juries. They're trying, but there's just not enough evidence. There's suspicion. There's odd stuff. There's weird, but there's nothing concrete enough to take her. In June 1st, 2012, Desiree took a uh, civil lawsuit out on Terry, claiming that she was responsible for her son, Kyron's missing. And you know what? Desiree's not giving up. She's not giving up, and she believes. Hold on, there's so many things that has pointed it to Terry. And the lawsuit was to prove that Terry had kidnapped Kyron. On the day he disappeared, she sued for $10 million in damages. On August 15th, 2012, a federal court judge denied a motion by Terry to delay the lawsuit. But in early of October, oh, Dee Dee Spicer, Terry's friend, refused to answer any of the 142 questions posed to her during a deposition regarding the lawsuit. Among these questions were several regarding Dee Dee's whereabouts. On June 4th, 2010, 
and her contact with Terry that day. She also declined to identify a photo of Kyron, whether she had met him and whether she knew his father, Cain. During the testimony provided by Cain in a separate hearing, the same year he stated that police had told him they have more probable cause to think Terry was involved in Kyron's disappearance than they did two years ago. On July 30th, 2013, it was announced that Young had dropped the case, Desiree, had dropped the lawsuit against Terry so not to interfere with the ongoing police investigation. I know this was a lot of dates, a lot of detail. I want to recap and tell you this. That day, Terry took her stepson, Kyron, to school with his science project. School did not really get functioning until about 1030 because of all the things going on. So it was definitely a day of difference where so much is going on, people are not going to notice things or anything going on. Claims that she's seen him go in almost to the classroom, which to me, I feel, now this is just my opinion, leaves an opening of, well, he totally wasn't in the classroom, you know, but I did see him. She claims that she left. And she went to a couple stores. Then after that, she drives around because her child has an earache, but yet takes time to stop at the gym, put the child in the daycare, finds out through all the detective work and all the information, she didn't even work out. She didn't even work out. But you know what she did do? She showed the lovely picture of him and her at the science fair. Okay. After that, you know, she completes her day of leaving there and then she goes home and waits for him to get off the bus with her husband, Kane, the father, and of course her young daughter. From there, we discussed all the details. It was a 10-day search, extreme search, over 1,300 people. This search has costed over $1.4 million. They have talked to everybody possible. They have looked everywhere within, within miles. They talked to her friend. That was supposed to be her, basically her bestie there for her. And if she thought for any reason that she wasn't innocent, she would not even be her friend. But yet this friend was claimed to be gone for an hour and a half during that time period of the driving around and all this stuff going on, basically from about 11.30 to 1, you know, and one is when Terry got back home. But yet, says, oh, I didn't leave. I was just back in the field. But you remember, she bought a phone, a non-traceable phone for Terry. So, what does Dee Dee know? When she was asked questions after being called to do a deposition, she refused to answer 142 questions. She would not even answer the question, did she recognize the picture of Kyron? Why are we playing games? Why are we not doing whatever it takes to find this little boy? Why is she not answering anything? We later find out that five months prior to Kyron disappearing, that Terry tried to have her husband murdered by the the gardener. The gardener that Cain didn't even know existed. Also, I want to mention this. A week after the disappearance, they end up, you know, pulling text messages, phones. You know, they look in. Looks like there was some texts and photos sent to one of Cain's old high school buddies from Terry by a guy by the name of Michael Cook, which he admits that this went on. He said there was sexting, but there was not any 
something more. We won't know if that's true or not, but the text messages were pretty graphic. So, you know, a morning mom, because she has been, you got to remember, she's been in Kyron's life for quite a few years. I mean, from the beginning. So, what, you know, seven years? I don't think this is how a morning mother would exactly, you know, we never know. We never know. But this does not seem appropriate behavior at the time anytime when you are married. That was also another reason why he was filing those papers. Where does this bring us to, guys? There's so many, like I said, layers at the beginning to unravel. But basically what I'm telling you is about the, the main points. Right now, it is still an open investigation and they don't have really any other leads. So, where is Terry now while well, everybody is still mourning, searching, looking? Well, you know, after she got divorced, you know, everything was really hard on her. Really hard on her. So, she decided she needed a new life. She needed to get away. And get away and start fresh. Because that was so much on her. She knew that she was being targeted for something that she just didn't do. And it really emotionally affected her. So she moves and tries to change her name so that she is not recognized. Because you know she's been all in the papers. She tried to change her name to Claire Sullivan. Which is a name out of a murder mystery book, I believe. Anyway, that was denied. She wasn't able to do that. So what she did is she went back to her maiden name, which was Moulton. So it was Terry Moulton. She's had arrest for auto theft. There has been arrest also of stealing a gun from a roommate. Now, someone has come forward. And 30 years ago, in 1990, a gentleman said that he was with her. And they had went and got Chinese food and was sitting in a park. And while they were sitting there eating, a guy jumps out of the bushes with a gun. Terry slips and says, he's here for you. I don't know all the full details on that. But luckily, the guy was able to get away. Nothing happened to Terry. I know that that has been looked at again. Guys, this was a lot to unravel. But a little boy doesn't just walk into school and then just disappear. I know that they looked at a lot of things. It could have been possible for someone else to come in and come through there and take him out the back door. It could happen. I mean, anything could happen. At that time, um, there was no cameras in there. As of right now, there are no extra leads, and they're not giving up on it. So, guys, I am going to put the information down in the description. And if you have any information, if you live in the Oregon area, please call the 1-800-THE-LOST. That can help us with any leads. Any tip may spark something. So, guys, as we conclude this... I always do something at the end of my episodes. And what I do is I create one of these prayer ribbons. And we put on here Kyron Horman 6 4 2010. It's the last time he has been seen. Seven years old. Everybody, I want to appreciate you sitting and listening to this story. We need help in getting this solved. The parents are not giving up. So, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you on the next search.